All right, guys. I'm excited to be here. Like like Johnny said, my name's Sean, one of the pastors here at Redemption, and we are starting a new series tonight, and I'm really excited uh, to dive into it. We are going to start in the book of Ruth. All right, and if you don't know anything about the book of Ruth, it is a story in the Old Testament, a historical story, so it really happened in a short book. And it's, it's this beautiful story about God's love and pursuit of his people. And it's also this uh, beautiful story of how he interacts with history and, and really uh, moves in the lives of his people. So we're going to learn about that over the next few weeks. Uh, but what I really want to go into today is set us up for this whole series. And we're going to talk about three themes or three ideas that go throughout the whole book of, of Ruth, uh, but are really in chapter one, and that's really what we're going to study tonight. So here are the themes we're going to talk about. It is the cost of disobedience, the hope of repentance, and the sovereignty of God. And that's going to be on the screen behind me. The cost of disobedience, the hope of repentance, and the sovereignty of God. And so we're going to start with the cost of disobedience. It's from Roman, uh, not Romans, Ruth. 1 verses 1 through 5. Let me read it for us. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons, and the name of that man was, anybody want to take a guess? How do you pronounce that? No, that's always a good guess, but not right. How do you pronounce it? No, it's Elimelech. And also, I'm convinced Johnny asked me to teach this message because he didn't want to say that on stage. So, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. The name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They were in the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These, two Moabite, uh, these took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. And both Malon and Chilion died. And so the women were left without her two sons and without her husband, the woman, Naomi. All right, so that's the start. And uh, again, there's a lot in there. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of dive into some of the background of this so we understand the whole book of Ruth and what's going on. But like I said, this is a historical story. So it really happened. These are real, real people and it's a story about God working the lives of his people. But with any story, just like if you're reading a, a book at your house, it starts off with characters. So the main characters of this story at this point are Elimelech, and he is uh, an Israelite. He's one of God's chosen people, and he lives in a town called Bethlehem. And he's got a wife named Naomi, and they have two sons together. And uh, it also gives some of the setting and background of this story. It says it's in the time of the judges. All right, and that's a historical point uh, um, in Israel's history. There's a book about it in the Old Testament called the Book of Judges. Does anybody know what the main theme of the Book of Judges is, like a reoccurring idea in it? It's a hard trivia question. What is it? Yeah, no, you, you pretty much nailed it. But there's this main idea that it says. It says the people of God did what was right in their own eyes, right? That's the book of Judges. They, they didn't obey God. They did what they wanted to do instead. And so the author of the, of the book of Ruth is trying to get us to understand, man, Elimelech lived in the time of Judges, and, and what they're about to do, what he's about to do, is just like what happens in the rest of the book of Judges, where Elimelech doesn't obey God. He does exactly what he wants instead. And so we see him do exactly that. Elimelech takes his family out of Israel because there's a famine and he goes to Moab. You might not think that's a big deal. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of food in Israel. He thinks there's more in Moab. That makes sense. But here's the issue. At this point in Israel's history, and if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, let me give you a summary. At this point in Israel's history, they're in the promised land. And the promised land was given to Israel to bless them. So kind of the background here is God calls a man named Abraham. You guys have probably all heard of Abraham. And he says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you and out of your people. And that's called Israel. And he says, I'm going to give you an awesome promised land and I'm going to take you there. But before he does that, uh, they go to Egypt for 400 years in slavery. God rescues them and eventually helps them defeat the people that live in the promised land and give them their land. 
And God says, if you obey me, if, I, if you make me your God and you follow me, I will bless you as you stay in the land. Uh, but that's not what Elimelech does. Elimelech doesn't stay in the promised land. He says, God, I don't trust you. I don't trust that you're going to provide for me. And he goes his own way to Moab. And again, you guys might not think this is a big deal. And you're like, Sean, why are you talking to me about all this uh, ancient Israel history? But the consequence of Elimelech disobeying God in this passage and what the, the biblical author wanted us to understand is that Elimelech died because he disobeyed God. That there's this real a right away consequence for him leaving the promised land and going to Moab. And then Naomi, his wife, and his two sons stay in Israel, uh, uh, sorry, stay in Moab for 10 years. They could go back to the promised land, they could go back and obey God, and they don't. They continue to disobey him. And on top of that, his two sons marry Moabite wives, which again, doesn't seem like a big deal. That's where you live. Where else are you going to find wives? But the, prom, uh, the problem was that when God took them to the promised land, one of the main commands he gave them was he told them to not marry women or men from other countries. And this is what he says. I'm going to read it really quickly for us. It's Deuteronomy 7, 3 through 4. It says this. Uh, this is God talking. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. And so, guys, that's exactly what happens to Elimelech's sons. They married two Moabite wives. They disobeyed God. And it wasn't because God didn't like people of other ethnicities or other countries. He wanted to protect his people from worshiping other gods and disobeying him. And so his anger was against these two men and he, he killed them. He let them die early and without kids. All right, and that seems intense, but one of the main themes of this whole book and of Ruth 1 is that there's consequences for sin, that there's a cost of disobedience. I want you guys to think about your life the last time you maybe disobeyed your parents, disobeyed somebody in authority, and what the consequence was. You don't need to shout that out, but I want you to think about what was that thing I disobeyed and what was my consequence? So for me, when I was right around your age, I grew up in a neighborhood where all, um, all the backyards were connected. It was like a giant circle, but all with the backyards. And so me and my friends, you know, every day after school or in the summer, we're just running from house to house playing. We would like find loose change in our parents' like couches and play poker. We would, we would run around the neighborhood, play video games, whatever. But this is going to age me a little bit. This was before cell phones were really popular or like... I didn't have a cell phone yet. And so what I had to do is when I went to my friend's house, I had to use their landline. And does anybody actually know what a landline is? Does anybody still have a landline? Has any of you ever, have you guys ever had a landline? Okay, well, leaders don't count. Come on, guys, you guys are old enough. But so I had to use their home phone, their landline, and I had to call my mom and say, hey, this is where I am. And every time I left to another house, I needed to tell them the same thing. And if I forgot to call my mom and let her know what house I was at, I would be in huge trouble. But she, because she'd call the house I was supposed to be at and I wouldn't be there and she'd freak out. She wouldn't know where I was. And I'd end up getting grounded. I wouldn't be able to play in my, my uh, neighborhood with my friends and I'd miss out on a ton of fun. And that's part, that's part of the cost of disobedience, right? You miss out on something good, like the freedom, the fun, the good things that my parents wanted me to have, the blessing of some of what my parents wanted me to have. I missed out on it. Uh, because I disobeyed them. And that same is true. The same is true for you guys. When you get in trouble, when you disobey, it's a missing out on blessing. It's a missing out on the good stuff that God does have for you, your parents do have you, for you. But the same is true for Elimelech, Naomi, and his whole family. God had good things for them. They chose to go their own way. They trusted themselves over God, and they missed out. And so it's, this is going to be on the screen for you, but here's, here's a big idea that I don't want you to miss. When we sin... We choose to miss out on some of the blessings of God. When we sin, we choose to miss out on the blessings of God. And some of it is this, guys, sin is serious. I want you to understand this. Sometimes sin feels like it's not a big deal. Everyone's doing it. You can't really see the consequence of it. But I, I want you to understand, sin always costs you more than what you gain from it. That sin is serious. It damages your life. And, and, and what we're saying, when we choose to sin, we're saying, God, I know what's best for you, 
are best for me. I know better than you. And we miss out on some of the goodness that God has planned for our life that's better for us uh, because we chose our own way, all right? So when we sin, we choose to miss out on some of the blessings of God. Uh, But that isn't just where God leaves us. It's not just, hey, you've sinned, I'm done with you, you've got no hope. Instead, he gives us hope of repentance as well. And guys, this is a, this is a long passage, but I want to read all of it to you so you get the story. So bear with me, follow along on the screen. Um, but this is a longer passage here. It's, it's uh, Ruth 1, 6 through 18. Then Naomi arose with her daughter-in-law to return to the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi saw her two da- said to her two daughters, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and lifted up their, voice, uh, their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that uh, they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, and even if I had a husband this night and bear sons, would you therefore wait till they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from uh, remarrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me, for my sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone in against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Rachel clung to her. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. All right, so there's a ton in there, a ton in that passage. But what's really important, what I need you to catch, is Naomi's response when she realized God fulfilled his promise, and she disobeyed God and the cost of it. And it happens at the very beginning there. It says that she's in this field in Moab and she hears that God has visited his people in Israel and that he's provided food for them. So the very thing that her and her husband doubted God would do, that he would provide for them, that he would bless them in the promised land, God did. And so in that moment, Naomi says, man, I've messed up. I've sinned against God. And she says, I'm gonna turn back and do what I should have done. So she goes from disobeying God and does 100% a 180 and begins to go back to the promised land, going back to Bethlehem where she lived before to obey God. And so her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, start to go with her. And as they start to travel, uh, Naomi decides to say, hey, guys, go back to the house of of your parents. Go back to, to your family, the place that you came from in Moab. You don't have to follow me to Israel. And, and uh, they, they persist, they say they want to follow her, but Naomi again argues with them and says, hey, uh, w- w- I'm not going to be able to provide another son for you to marry. And historically, just to give you some background, uh, they would have married, these, these two uh, women would have married Naomi's next oldest sons, but she didn't have any. And she said, hey, I'm not going to get married anytime soon. I'm probably not going to have any more sons. Don't Uh, not get remarried. Don't stay a widow in your young age. Go back to your people and find a husband. And with that, Orpah decides to go back. And it says she goes back to her people, but more importantly, it says that Orpah goes back to the gods of her people. She goes back to worshiping the gods of Moab. And so what's important there is Orpah would have known who the one true God was, the God of Israel. She would have experienced him. She would have known him. She would have heard about him by being married to her husband, by being in Naomi's family, and she rejects God and goes back to the gods of Moab. But Ruth does something different. Ruth uh, has loyalty to Naomi. She loves her her mother-in-law, but something else about her is distinct. And she says this famous line where she says, your people will be my people. Where you go, I will go. But most importantly, uh, your God will be my God. 
And so it seems to show that Ruth experienced some of who the one true God was. And she decided, hey, uh, even though I'm leaving all of my family, I'm leaving all of the country I've ever known, I will go back, leave my culture, and go with you, Naomi, and worship the one true God. And what's really important is they were going in the wrong direction. They were disobeying God. Ruth grew up worshiping uh, fake, false gods, and yet they're turning to obey and follow God. I want you to think for a second, have you guys ever gone the wrong direction, ever been lost, anything like that? Uh, For me, uh, my dad and I actually just went camping about two weeks ago. It was just like a father-son trip in Pennsylvania. It was a lot of fun. We were at a state park. But we were exploring some of the hiking trails there. And I don't know if you've ever been in a state or national park. You don't usually have cell phone service. So I couldn't figure out how long the trail was um, that we're going to try to check out. So we just kind of wung it. We were like, hey, this trail looks fun. Let's go down it. And we get about an hour into the hike, and, I, and we uh, realize, how long is this hike actually going to be? There's no end in sight. We eventually got some cell phone service, and we're like, this is going to be like over a 10-mile hike if we keep going. And we had to make a decision. Do we turn around? Do we call it at like a four-mile hike, head back the way we came? Or do we make it like a five-hour hike and go all the way through it? Right? And so we turned around. We headed back. See, that's, that's what we're supposed to do when we make a mistake, when we do the wrong thing, when we sin against God. What he calls us to do is he, he tells us to do something called repentance or to repent, which means we don't keep running after sin, but we turn around, 100% around, and say, I'm going to pursue God instead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repent or turn from what I was doing. And that's what we need to do with our sin, uh, but that's what Ruth and Naomi do for us here. And we just see it as like a preview, a foreshadowing in uh, Ruth chapter 1. But we're going to see this play out all throughout uh, the, for, uh, the, the rest of the book of Ruth. That, that we need to turn towards God. And when we do, there's hope for salvation for us. And the beautiful thing is we are uh, far enough in history that we know how that's possible for us. That's through Jesus, through his death and resurrection for us and what he's done for us. And so how we receive forgiveness is we need to, again, like Naomi, we have to turn from what we were doing that's wrong, acknowledge our sin and our need for a Savior, and run towards God. And say, I'm not going to live this way anymore. I'm going to live for you. And when we do that, God meets us in it. No matter what we've done, no matter how messed up we are, no matter what country we're from, what we look like, no matter what people think about us, God makes hope for salvation for people that turn to him when they turn from their sin. All right, it's the second point there, second theme. And then the third one is the sovereignty of God. And this comes from Ruth 1, 19 through 22. It says this, so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, do not call me Naomi, uh, but call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. And so Naomi and Ruth, they continue, they repent, they go back to the promised land, they turn towards God and away from their sin. And when they get to Bethlehem, they recognize Naomi. It's been over 10 years, but they recognize her and they're like, is that the Naomi that left and went to Moab? And she responds to them, don't call me Naomi anymore, which means pleasant in Hebrew, but call me Mara, which means bitter. And she explains why. And it sounds like she's angry with God here, but what what Naomi is really doing is she's proclaiming that God has been sovereign in control of her life. That God has been this active participant in what's gone on in her life. And when I say sovereignty, it's a big word. You, You might not know what that means, but what sovereignty means is it means total control. That God has control or total control over our lives. So I want you to think about it this way. I want you to think, what are the things in your life that you actually have control over? All right, shout some of them out. What do you actually have control over? Okay. You're on love. What you, I, you said too many of them at the same time. What'd you get? Action. So what you do? 
yourself, right? Some of it's like the words you say. Your f- Man, I don't have control over my feelings. I don't know. There's a lot of good answers. I don't know if that one's true. I don't, I don't have control over my temper. But like your clothes you wear. So all of those are partially true, right? We have, we have partial control. I have control over my actions. I have control. You, you could say I have control over the words that I say, but you could lose your voice tomorrow and not be able to talk at all, right? So you have some control, but you don't have total control. You could say I have control over what I wear, but some of that's affected by your parents, how much money you have for clothes, where, what country you live in, because you would wear totally different clothes if you lived in a different country, right? So you have some control. And so what I want you to think about, you guys have control in some ways, but God has control in a way that is, is totally different than us. That God um, is, is totally in control, that, that he is in control of all things, that he's an active participant in your life. All right, I need you to get that. God is not a God that has just like made the universe and let it go and said, hey, best of luck. God cares about your lives. He's moving in your lives. He's got a plan and purpose for each and, each and every single one of you. And so what helps me understand that is God, we, we believe that God created the universe. He created every atom, every molecule, everything that's in existence, he made for his purposes. And every single thing that exists bows its knee to the will of God and what he wants them it to do. Uh, a, a, a pastor that's, that's now passed away said this, it's R.C. Sproul. He says, if there's one single molecule in the universe running around loose, totally free of God's sovereignty, then we have no guarantee that a single promise of God will ever be fulfilled. And so what he's saying is, man, it's in God's character to be in control of all things, for him to do what he's promised us, for him to be good and all powerful and what he's done in Jesus, for that to be true, God has to be in control of all things, that he works in our lives. And and I don't know if you caught that, but this is exactly what Naomi is saying in this passage. She said, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. So she's acknowledging that God gave me consequences, that I disobeyed God, and God put things in my life to, to bring me back to himself, to give me consequences. He, he, she gives him credit from bringing him, uh, them back from Moab to Israel. She goes on here and says, Uh, the Lord testified against me that Almighty has brought calamity on me. She's saying the things that have happened in my life that have been hard, it's been the Lord's doing for a purpose. If you go back to the passage before, she says that God showed up in Israel and brought about food to them. It's that God intervenes in the lives of his people, that he's working, that he's got a plan for us. And what I want you to get here, and what I think Naomi is going to get to, and you'll see throughout this whole passage, is that, or sorry, not this whole passage, this whole book, is that God is working in your life for your good and his glory. It's going to be on the screen behind me. God is working in your life for your good and his glory. And Naomi is even, even in her frustration about her life, she's not, she's not mad at God because of the consequences he's given her. She's acknowledging, man, I've run away from God. He's worked these things out uh, to, to bring something good about. And you'll see that in the next few chapters. We don't see it yet in, here in Ruth, but God is working in the lives of Ruth and Naomi for good and for his glory. And I want you to understand for your life as well, God is working in your life for his good in your glory, that God has a plan for you, that God has made you for a purpose, that he cares about what's going on in your life. And in the same way that Naomi and Ruth are going through hard things, they're going through the death of their husbands, that's a hard thing to experience. And yet God is intervening in their life and cares about them and wants good for them. And the same is true for you. And so I hope as you wrestle Uh, with your faith, as you wrestle with your faith in God, even when things are hard and you don't understand him, I hope that you can trust that God wants good, is working your life for good and for his glory. Let me just wrap up with a quick application. Uh, First, the cost of disobedience. If this is true, guys, if there's actually a cost of uh, disobedience and sin's serious, you, you've got to run from it. Don't pretend like sins like this cute, cuddly thing that won't hurt you. It is dangerous. It's like snuggling a porcupine. Don't do it. Sin is bad. And so uh, what 
the book of Ruth, what God's trying to tell us here is to run away from sin. Don't snuggle up against it. Run from sin because it will damage your life. It will hurt you. And what God has for you is better. Don't just run away from sin, but there's hope and repentance. So turn to God. Don't just run from wrong action, but run to a God that's made a way for you to be forgiven, that loves you, that wants good for you, that has a plan to forgive you. Even if you've done terrible things, if you've messed up your life, there's still hope in Jesus. And lastly, uh, if God is sovereign, if God is really in control of all things and you can trust him, when life's hard, when you don't understand what he's doing, God is working in your life. And, and I really just want to encourage you, turn to him. Believe that God wants good for you, that he loves you, that he's working your life even when you don't see it. And I promise you, you will see him show up. All right? So I hope this helps you understand the whole book of Ruth, but I hope it also encourages um, you this whole week as well as you wrestle with just everyday life and following Jesus. But with that, let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you so much for today. I thank you uh, just for your word. And even though the, the book of Ruth is, is in the Old Testament, it takes a little bit to understand the history of what you're doing and what was going on. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us through your word, that you would remind us that you love us and that your will, your desires for our life are better, uh, better than sin and the temptation to run from you, that you are always better and that you've got a plan for our lives and you love us.